Welcome everyone. <laughs> Yay, little waves. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am so happy to welcome you to our first um, part of our series, the hashtag TX Book Chat series um, for the year of 2022. This is a very special one um, because it's almost independent of the series. We have a conversation plan with our national student poet of the Southwest in Texan, Keiichi Muba. And we could not be happier to have you here with us, Keiichi. Um, of course, this is being recorded and people are going to watch it wherever and however. Um, but right now I'm just, I'm pretending like we're all having coffee and we're just chatting about poetry and dreams and life. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the, I'm Rebecca Manley and I run the Texas Center for the Book in Austin. Um, I'm at, my background is the historic Texas State Library and Archives Commission where the Texas Center for the Book is housed um, right next to the Texas Capitol. Um, but we're gonna talk about how it's such a big deal um, for Texas to have one of um, one of our national student poets be from here, and I'm going to have our guests discuss that. But I just want to say this is an honor to be in this conversation. More context will be had, but if you're just tuning in, you're like, "Oh, this is interesting." Yes, it is. Keep watching, um, especially for our Texas um, educators and librarians. This is something that you should be able to and hopefully will share with your students. And then we're going to have nuggets of um, opportunity for you to actually connect with KG, um, to meet with your students um, as their schedule allows and as opportunity allows. So stay tuned for, for possibilities. This is a year of possibilities, right? So um, I want to just talk a little bit about the National Student Poets Program. I'm just going to read it basically. And then of course the meat and the context will happen with Dennis and Hannah. So the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, and the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers partner to present the National Students Poets Program, the nation's highest honor for young poets, grades 10 through 11, creating original work. Annually, five students are selected for one year of service, each representing a different geographic region of the country. The program believes in the power of youth voices to create and sustain meaningful change and supports them in being heard. Oh, that is a touching statement and so powerful and I can attest to that. So let me just go ahead and introduce uh, Hannah and Dennis and then they will take it from here, so to speak, and then we can get to our honored guest. So since 2014, Hannah Jones has been the National Student, Students Poets Program Manager at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, the nonprofit presenting the national presenting the scholastic art and writing awards and dennis nangle is the senior program officer at the office of library services at the institute of museum and library services in addition to being imls's program manager for the national student poets program he works with the grants to state office which oversees an annual funding program for the state library agencies across the country this is his fifth year with working with the National Students Poet Program. So, wow, I know that was a mouthful, but they do a lot. And so I'm gonna just pass it on over to them and so they can put that into real terms so you can Velcro to it. Very, very warm welcome to you, Dennis and Hannah. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm gonna share my screen with a brief um, slideshow uh, just to kind of over, an overview of the program very quickly. Um, and just to kind of explain why we're involved in this and what our, our role is. Um, so uh, as Rebecca really wonderfully already laid out, um, we are, as an agency, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, are the primary source of federal support um, for the country's 123,000 libraries and 17 1,500 museums. So I emphasize the sheer number of those institutions around the country because that is a huge component of why we're involved in this program. Our goal is to um, kind of sort of elevate the important role that libraries and museums have as institutions and community hubs where we can provide um, wonderful, promising voices like the student poets uh, 
a, a space to not only share their perspective, but also to sort of bring poetry literacy to all parts of, of the country. And so that's a, that's a huge component of why we're involved in the Student Poets Program. And, um, and really what sets it apart is from other sort of arts um, award uh, initiatives from other agencies is that while we want to obviously award and congratulate and recognize the talent of these five young poets, it's really just the beginning. They're awarded and they're recognized for their skills, but then their year of service begins. And that's where we hope to really activate and mobilize a lot of their wonderful, passionate ideas by placing them with a bunch of wonderful um, community institutions like museums and libraries. So I um, show this map to, again, emphasize that as a federal agency, national impact and national reach is very important. And that is um, another reason why we're a huge supporter of, of the National Student Poets Program, because not only do we want to hear from um, diverse voices that represent different geographic backgrounds, but we also want to get the students out to as many different parts of the country as possible. And a lot of, a lot of our funding for this program goes toward getting the students out in different parts of the country. And so, um, as you can see, there are a lot of wonderful um, purple dots at Texas, um, and, <laughs> and we're very grateful for that. Um, and it really just reflects um, not only the, the talent of um, young Texan poets, but also what we think to be support um, systems, uh, both in the schools and hopefully in the libraries as well, to, to find these promising young voices and, and encourage them to pursue things like this. And I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah now to talk about some of the program goals. Gotta unmute. Thank you so much, Dennis um, and Rebecca and Keiji. I'm so excited uh, to be here to talk about National Student Poets Program. Um, as mentioned, I'm the program manager um, at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which runs the Scholastic Art and Writing awards and that is um we are so honored to be able to work on this program because we get to invest in the art of poetry and creative teams who have exceptional leadership potential so as dennis mentioned it's not just about giving an award it's about recognizing talent but also social activism and um the work that these young people are hoping to do in their own communities so we give that recognition, but we also provide the National Student Poets with opportunities to hone their leadership skills um, and combine that with poetry uh, while engaging them in study of leadership grounded in service. So it's really based in community service work. Um, and then once we have invested all of this uh, in each of the national student poets, um, we have them put it into practice in their community service projects, which are designed and implemented solely based on their passions, what excites them, what they feel they can bring to their communities um, alongside of poetry. You would pass to the next slide, Dennis. Thank you so much. Um, so the selection process, um, in order to be eligible for the National Student Poets Program, the first step is to submit to the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, and it's a national competition. Um, at the first level, we receive over 19,000 uh, poetry submissions in total. And then that is narrowed to 1,500 gold key winners, which are regional winners throughout the country. Um, there's another round of adjudication, and from the 1,500 gold key winners, around 200 national silver and gold medals are awarded in poetry. Um, at that point, 40 of those semifinalists from 10th and 11th grade are selected um, to submit additional materials in a portfolio that includes not just more poetry, but also personal statement and a statement on why poetry. What is it about poetry that excites them, that calls to them? From those 40 semifinalists, five national student poets are selected, one from each of the five regions of the US. Um, and KT is uh, our um, South 
a West a poet for this year, the class of 2021. Um, I want to briefly read Keiji's bio before I introduce her. Um, so Keiji Mba is a senior at Carnegie Vanguard High School and a Houston native. She founded her school's poetry club in late 2019 and serves as an editor for her school's award-winning literary magazine, The Courtyard. She first found a love for poetry when she stumbled upon a YouTube video of a Brave New Voices slam competition in the fall of 2019 and has been performing and writing poetry ever since. Her poetry explores many avenues from making the known strange to chronicling her experiences as a Nigerian American and the histories of her people. She's also passionate about strengthening her community and serves on the activism and community outreach committee of her school's Black Student Union and has interned with NASA to help address problems within the food supply chain. She advanced to the semifinals of the 2020 Space City Slam, Houston's largest teen slam competition before it was canceled due to COVID-19 and her work can be found or is forthcoming in Blue Marble Review, the Incandescent Review, Elementia and elsewhere. So I'm gonna pass it on to Keiji now, I believe. Yay, KG. <laughs> so good to have you with us. It's nice to be here. That is quite the bio. And I've actually read it multiple times and heard it multiple times. And every time I'm like, wow, wow. <laughs> just going places. Um, I just get really, really excited when they go through how many submissions and the funneling down of numbers. It looks like an upside down Christmas tree. Um, where were you? I mean, how, what do you remember about hearing the news that you were one of the chosen five? So I have to break it down a little bit. The first, like my first reaction to the news was, <clears throat> I, I don't remember what I was doing. I was like on my laptop doing homework or something. And I saw an email notification and it was the director of the Alliance uh, of Young Artists and Writers, which is a partner of the program and telling me to set up a meeting time, but he had like exciting news to tell me. And I was like, what can that news be? Um, <laughs> and I saw there was like five slots for the meeting and I was like, okay, like, I didn't want to say it, but I was like, okay, did I like get it? And then I went to the, I went to the meeting um, and they like officially told me, <clears throat> um, but I guess like a little like tidbit is like the whole meeting, I was like turned, to the side because I had gone to the dentist that day and half my face was frozen so I didn't want it to be seen um but yeah that's that's essentially how I heard about the news I love that I love that backstory too <laughs> um so you know it, it talked they talked about it a little bit in the the profile but your your story of how you got into poetry is really unique can you talk about that please uh, yes. So I feel like, at least for me, I never really like thought about poetry. It was like, oh, we like, it's sometimes a unit in English throughout school. Um, and we always like focus on old written poetry. Um, but once again, I was doing homework or like I had just finished homework. I was like back from soccer practice. And so I decided to go to YouTube and in the recommended, there was like a video from the Brave New Voices Teen Slam competition. And I watched it and I was like, like, I really liked it. And I just continued to watch them. That's what inspired me to start the poetry club at my school. And then like I entered my first slam competition a little bit before the pandemic. I got some club members to enter as well. Um, and essentially that competition of like the four winners, they would then go to the Brave New Voices Slam competition. Um, but I, I ended up doing the first round, I advanced the semifinals, and then like I said, my bio got canceled due to COVID. And then from there, like at the beginning of COVID, I think like I wrote one additional poem, but I was kind of in limbo because essentially like I'd done some, like I went to like some online slams and they weren't really, it wasn't really the same, like when you're in like the room with the stomping and the snapping and all of that. Um, but, <sighs> I, this is a long story, but after, like, I didn't write for a little while, and then, what was it, like, my sister had, like, some assignment in her Texas history class to write, she wrote, like, some short story about a hurricane, and, like, she printed it out, and I was reading it, and I was like, you know what, like, 
maybe I should just try like writing like written poetry. And so I had read some written poetry, like I had gotten more into it. So I decided to like take the leap, like start writing, even though it's like a little bit less comfortable for me in uh, general, because I feel like it's easier for me to like command a stage. But when it's like written, you it's it's all left up to the reader because you can envision something and perform something a certain way. So people hear it a certain way but you have to be very meticulous and careful with how you write something if you want it to be read that particular way. Um, so yeah. Well, I think- is, No, oh, it's not, you said it's a long answer. I'm like, this is literally why we're talking because we want to know these answers. So keep going with that. I, I, what, I, what I'm struck by is someone being brave and putting themselves out there with slam poetry inspired you to be brave and be like, you didn't go at it and a, okay, I'm gonna just journal my poems and maybe one day I'll share them with the world. It's like, you're like, okay, I like that. And I'm putting it out there and I'm gonna bring other people into the fold as well. What has your experience been with starting the poetry uh, with, with the club at school and, and bringing people into something you love? I feel like it's really been interesting seeing like the different kinds of people that are into poetry. Like there are people that I, I wouldn't have pinned as like, poets or people that like poetry that are interested in it. And I think um, uh, in general, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. I just want to know more about what it's been like to, to start a poetry club at school and like what that process has been to bring people into something you, you love and enjoy. Uh, it's been a very like communal process, community process. I feel like we're all they're uplifting each other. Sometimes like I'll give, I'll show them different poets, show them different styles of poetry. We'll come with our prompts the next meeting. We'll share um, and sort of just like uplifting each other and like helping us along as we grow as poets. Um, I think that's really been like the key part of establishing the club at my school. Um, yeah, and it's helped me grow as a poet. I love that it's being communal and that's why you are the perfect. <laughs> Texan to choose for this is because this this award and this distinction, you know, it's it's a recognition. Like Hannah said, it's also an opportunity to build that community. Um, and I love that you're that you were doing that already with your school. You're talking about choosing poets that inspire y'all in the club. Can you talk a little bit more about poets that inspire you personally? Yes. So I feel like. When, as a reader, when I like read books, I'm, I like to read books um, with like characters my own age. And I think when it comes to poetry, I tend to be drawn to poets that are around my own age. Um, some poets that uh, like I'm, I really like are like Ari Lore, um, Monty Davis, Darius Atafet Peckham. And these are all like young, maybe like college age, uh, so a little older than me, but definitely young poets. And I think, I also like read older poets, like don't get me wrong, but I think, I don't, I don't know why, but I feel like their work just, it might not necessarily be about something I relate to, but it just speaks to me more. I don't know. Well, speaking of um, what's speaking to you and rising poets and what would you say to those who are aspiring to be a poet or to get into poetry, either slam or page of any age? I would say like read or watch a lot and write a lot. And I would like to emphasize, like, don't be afraid to share because at least for me, I feel like the essence of poetry is, is sharing it. So like, don't hold back, even if it's just to share with one person if you if you know you don't feel comfortable like sharing it in front of like a huge crowd or something but like try or like try to share your poetry and and just really get involved just really like read a lot write a lot just do as much as you can and what I mean what does that feel like when you kind of fight any sort of fear not saying you ever had fear but to to put it out there and, and be like, okay, this is what I've written. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. Like, what is that feeling when you put your words out there into the world? Um, so I guess it'd be a, a little different depending on like whether it's slam or page. I feel like the first time I did a 
uh, slam performance at that competition, I was like, I was sitting down like next to my mom in the audience and they like, I was shaking before they called me because I was the last person to go. And then I was, or no, I was the first person to go the second round, I was the last person. I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, oh, and I was shaking. And then they had to like adjust the mic for me. And then, but the thing is like, once I started, like it, like all those nerves like left. And I feel like getting up on stage and like reading poem, it's like really just, you can see the way everyone's reacting and like, <clears throat> like a big thing in slam is like snapping or like stomping. And so just really seeing how you move the room is like a really, it's a really nice experience. Um, and then in terms of page poetry, I think in ter I, I guess I don't, you don't really get to see people read your poem unless you like hand it to them directly. Cause like I've submitted things to literary magazines and they might like go ahead and publish it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, look, that's my name. Like I'm right there. And the thing is like, I read literary magazines and I read other people's work, but it's not like they're watching me read their work. So um, the sort of like feedback I've gotten from written words, maybe someone telling me like, like when I was on the call of the National uh, Student Poets Call, the director of IMLS was like, oh, I really like this poem that you wrote. And then like, he told me a story related to it. And I guess those are the sort of interactions you get with page poetry. So like after the fact or later, but it's definitely, it's definitely still nice seeing and knowing it's out there, but it's more like secretive, like who's reading this? Like I'm reading this, but like who's reading mine? And like, you'll never know, but sometimes you get to. You really don't really know it kind of, we talked about this when we talked last time, like it's almost a surrender when you put your words out there. Who knows who's going to read it and how they're going to go, how it's going to take on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any more thoughts on that? Uh, I think in, in terms of like words taking a life on their own, I feel like page poetry definitely really, really like lets itself to that um, because you like you're putting your words out there and it's going out there and someone like there are like so many different scenarios as to like where someone could be reading it when they could be reading it like oh they're reading on the bus to school or oh they're like in a cafe or oh, like there's just so many different things that and holds that your work can take because you could have had this like first intention or like oh this is my poem this is like what it means this is like how it's supposed to be read but someone could Look at your poem a completely different way and ha and have it mean something completely different to them and read it in a completely different manner so i think page poetry allows itself to really transform like off that page um, and for the reader i like that allows itself to transform so i can just say it's such an honor to have a texan receive this award um what is that like to represent the southwest and what does it mean to be a Houstonian and a Texan in this role? Um, it's definitely been interesting. I like I, I like it a lot, but I've been able to do a lot of things with my city. Like um, I was able to do something with the Houston Children's Museum. I was able to do an event with the Houston mayor. And I think really Houston has like, uh, given me like agency with this role. Like they provided many opportunities for me to use it and they've been welcoming of it. Um, like the first opportunity was like, someone had reached out to my school principal to get to me uh, for me to like go to the museum. So it's definitely nice and representing the Southwest. I mean, like I love Texas, no matter what you could say about it. Like I like Texas and you know, just being able to represent my state and my region as a whole has definitely been nice. And does, does being a Texan and having this distinction, does it affect your work now moving forward in any way? Um, I think I have written like some poems like inspired by like Texas and Houston or like they've weaved like a little bit into certain poems I've written. Um, I think it's just a matter of like time and like seeing like where my work takes me. Um, but like if it comes naturally, then like I won't like stop it. If I if I want to write a poem about like specifically Texas, like I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. If it flows your way, well, I look forward to reading those. So we're gonna do a little pause for a poetry break and do some more questions at the end. 
Um, now for the moment you've all been waiting for, we can talk about poetry all day long, but we're so excited to hear, you know, one or two poems that you would like to share with us, Keiji, and, and tell us about these poems that you're about to share, please. So uh, I have it on my phone. So this, yeah. second, um, this first poem, uh, I, this first poem, I, I think like the process of writing it was definitely very uh, direct, like working with my, like I remember like I came up with the idea for the poem and I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be like a great poem if like I write it the way I want to. And then I like took my little notebook and I already had like stories my parents had told me, but like I went to them and I was like asking them question and question, like writing down answers and like trying to get a feel for like what it is that I'm about to write. And so it was a lot of stuff I wrote and like taking that and then making it into poetry was nice. I'm being very vague because I want the poem to speak for itself. Yes, yes. But it was definitely um, like a homage to like just a lot of things. And it is, it is true. Um, Cause someone had asked me once when I read it, oh, is that true? And I was like, yes, yes it is. But anyway, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, my great grandfather had nine wives. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Chinue Achebe. Egu adia tuafo, oburuzo. My great grandfather's squinting eyes drew haze over the horizon belonging to my great grandmother, creating a painting of African sun. She was a woman of the earth, the earth made woman of her. Dirt laced fingers and satin peppered knees spoke love to corn and cassava, praying only to the God she held within her bosom. At the rise of afternoon, pestle etched callous as she pounded fufu into brown freckled mortar. Like all men, my great grandfather admired. His yellowed eyes enchanted by her flat nose and cow belly plump lips. To her skin peeled ripe from ebony and hips swept wide for birth. To the sweet smell of a hard working woman. So he grew chests and three goats to bring back to her village. And she agreed to be his seventh wife. Utumi Wetebele. Drums beat to the laughter of pot-bellied men. Wine carrying is the wedding. My great-grandfather squatted hidden in Mariah Bush leaves, but my great-grandmother's feet kissed the ground to its pulsing rhythm. Red wrapper bouncing to her waist, palm wine swimming in the ivory tusk of her forefathers. She searched through purple plume grass and behind corkwood trees, only finding men pretending to be my great-grandfather until the rustle of Mariah Bush leaves seized her eyes. Tusk weighed his hands, palm wine touched his lips, and a river stretched out around their families. Manu akaradiotsu, onieratu, ibe yararatu. My great grandfather's land can make a village, splitting baths of Dutch rich colors, for each wife had a house for her own, and they stuck together tightly. Clay, woman, bamboo stick children, leading to feasts that were long and winding sun-fed siblings chasing behind the shadows of their mothers and snapping stomachs waiting for their dent of Gary to be filled with aqua soup, the open air hugging them tenderly. And that is the first poem. I'm um, so struck by the visuals in that poem, sun-fed siblings. I was there with you. <laughs> I think that I would, I would, I just really wanted to like paint a picture of like pre-colonial Nigeria and like pay homage to my ancestors, my great grandparents. And then this second poem, it's more, I like to say open to interpretation. Um, and I intend for it to be that way, but okay. It's, this title is Red-Eyed Woman. Red-Eyed Woman, won't you wake today? Thumb through the waiting morning, undress from your dreams, chew on rotten berries, slow hissing juice dripping down your teeth. Now you'll wash that hair in a snap of green bush, tangled, twigged, and scratching. Grow wild, honey, browned and sicky, rub the burn across your skin. Watch the winds peel it back for you. Don't wait. Drag those fingernails in the dirt. Let them go bent, black, and nasty. Sprinkle what's left to bake on the open white flesh of your thigh. There, it's still burning. That smell, that awful smell is like home and has itself strapped to your boot. 
Take it off and throw it behind you. Inhale once, inhale twice. Release a scraggly howl for the river and tomorrow. See only one follow. Cup your mouth to the water. Swish, let it know the wet, then spit. Keep the thirsty. It gets cold and the happy fat shrinks off your belly. So you eat the chapped flakes from your lips. All those memories already faded, fading, gone. And that is. Thank you. I just feel like the talk after that, it's like, oh, wait, I don't want to fill any space with words because I, if I had my way right now, I'd just be like, okay, we're done. Let me just sit with those words and think for a while and absorb them to keep the thirsty, the wind, peel it back. So I know that, that those poems have so much weight and so many visuals. Do they take you to a, se a separate spot in your mind each time? Or do you return to a location like, like home each time you read them? Oh. <laughs> um, I think, I feel like this, this sort of experience is a lot, I can really tie it more into the poem Red-Eyed Woman because I feel like when I first wrote it and then like rereading it and then rereading it and then like it's definitely meant different things to me each time um especially like I would say it's like one of my favorite poems to read um because I feel like I although I read it like the way it's um arranged it's like a paragraph with like splashes instead of like line by line and I think being able to play with like the pacing but also like the message and how it can be interpreted different ways because I like hearing like people say, oh, like this is what I got from it or this is what I got from it. And it's like interesting to see because I feel like that poem is a lot more, um, like the reader, can, it has a lot more um, ideas and messages that the reader can like draw from it. And then for my great grandfather had nine wives. It, I also really like reading that one. Um, and I think it does, it's hard because it's my own words, but like, I feel it It does paint a picture and it's like, it, I'm really like proud of this poem because it did what I wanted it to. Like, mm -hmm. because sometimes I'll like approach a poem and it might, it just doesn't exactly hit the spot the way I want it to, but like, I feel like this did it. And being able like, I paint to paint a vivid picture and, to have like uh, a poetic um, general, so yeah. Yeah, I feel like it definitely, <laughs> it definitely hit the spot for me. And two things I just want to call out right now that have really struck me is you've given permission. One, when you talked about just putting your words out there and talking about being nervous when you do, and just like giving your people permission, like it's going to be different, it's going to be hard put yourself out there. You may not, you may feel er nervous, but also it's really powerful for me to hear you say that you take different meanings at different times, because I think one of the things that is an obstacle for people when they're reading poetry, is they're like, I don't think I get it. I don't think I get it. Um, I'm embarrassed because I don't get it. And the fact that it can change feels liberating to me. You know, it makes it approachable. Um, I actually you saying that I can't remember exactly who said it but there's a quote and it's like if a poem gives you pleasure you've understood it and like I feel like I, I really like that poem that that quote and it just encompasses poetry as a whole um yes well and you saying that um I think it ties in perfectly to one of my last questions and Hannah and Dennis, if y'all have anything, you know, be thinking of it. If not, no, no pressure. I can definitely keep running with a few more questions, but you know, you sharing that I feel is, is, is an act of service for all that are watching. Um, and with the actions of service in this year of service, you know, how does that look for you? How do you imagine, how do you imagine that playing out? So in terms of, I have the ideas for my, so, okay. In terms of acts of service, I'm really open to like 
doing anything. Like I've done different, uh, like I did a World Children's Day event with the Houston mayor. I did something at the Children's Museum Houston. And then I also have like my community service projects, but I'm also open to doing things like outside of the realm of my community service projects, like the thing I did with the mayor and the thing I did with the Children's Museum. In terms of my community service projects, I have three things planned. Um, the first being I'm actually leading it March. The first time I'm doing it is March 3rd, um, but essentially it's a poetry and sound discussion and I'm leading it with high schoolers. I plan on leading it at three different high schools, my own high school, which is a magnet school, and then a art school within the district and then a regular high school that way like to foster different kind of conversations. Um, and essentially it's gonna be focusing on the musicality of poetry on the page, but also looking a little bit at slam poetry and just seeing the way the, the different ways like poetry carries music. Um, and then the other thing that I might be able to do is I to partner with a podcast um, and sort of discuss um, poetry and coming of age. Um, and that's still in motion. So we'll see whether that happens. And then the third one I had to vamp. I had um, an idea planned to do like poetry and movement focused on poetry and ASL. Um, I'm, I'm having to change that a little bit, but it's still gonna have that core like poetry and ASL. Uh, I would just have to shift where I'm doing it. So we'll see about that. But those are my three um, community service projects that I have planned. And they're so different and unique. And I think that that speaks to like who you are and what you're willing to offer and share. And of course, no promises because schedules get full and I know that your plate is just going to keep getting more and more piled high with opportunities. Um, however, for educators and teachers, are you open to them contacting you? Of course, they'll be through Hannah and we'll put those slide, that slide up at the end, but are you open to them reaching out and saying, hey, I heard this, would you be up for this? I mean, at least to have a conversation. Yes, absolutely. Like anyone that wants to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. Um, I mean, that's the point of this year of service. I really just, and even if you think it's like, oh, it's not super related with the things you said before, like still please reach out. Like I'm open to doing many things, many things. Uh, to reach as like as wide as an audience as I can um, is the purpose of this. So please reach out. Yeah, I mean, this, and this is such an opportunity. So whenever you watch this, don't think, oh, my time has passed vibration is hit like like I said things hit you know obviously KG is headed to wonderful options and possibilities but it doesn't hurt to reach out and um you know we're going to put that contact information up at the end so it'll be one of the last things but um does anyone else have any questions or our thoughts for KG that we'd like to to ask um yeah I I, well, I have kind of a comment going into a question. I was just thinking about those two poems specifically that you just read. And um, what I appreciate about the program itself and my experience, even as kind of like a enjoyer of the program um, is I, you know, was an English major and I kind of appreciated poetry um, kind of from a distance, I would say. Um, and, what I appreciate about this program is how it makes poetry a lot more accessible than I thought it could be. And um, what I like about the juxtaposition of those two poems that you read is there's the one format, which is more of a, what would you expect? Kind of a traditional narrative arc, if you will. You know, I, I can follow what's happening and, and there's a bit of a story being told there. And then the other poem is more of like capturing sort of an abstract moment or feeling or it's kind of suspended in time in a lot of ways and it, it it reads more like I'm taking in like you were saying like a painting of 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 imagery which is really nice to see it can be all of these different things so I just um like Rebecca mentioned the the freedom to just kind of meet it meet the meet the poem where it is and and not have to especially if you've only been in, introduced to poetry in a heavily academic sense, you're kind of trained to think, what is, what is the right answer sort of with, <laughs> with what this is supposed to mean? And it is nice to have that more of a, a roomy space 
to just say, oh yeah, there it is. I've, I've experienced that for what it is. And, and that's kind of the point of it in and of itself. So yeah, I just wanted to make that sort of note. The other uh, actual question um, that I'm curious about is, I think about your interests and all of the work that you've done and that you're doing, just the committees that you serve on, and they're all incredibly interesting. And I'm just, you know, I think about how inter interdisciplinary your interests are. And I was wondering, since you've taken up poetry or gotten more involved, have you, has it sort of worked itself in uh, the other areas of your interests, um, which you kind of spoke to because your, your, your projects were kind of touching on that. But I'm just wondering from a, from a more like a transferable, transferability standpoint, have you seen your poetry help in other areas? I feel like at the, I, I really like that question. I feel like at the very beginning, it was like, okay, like, like I'm really into STEM. Like I plan on um, doing engineering in college. And so I was like, I really like both of these, but like, they're so separate, you know? I was like, there's no way, you know? Um, but actually recently, um, I'm, I'm currently doing an internship with uh, this nonprofit called Read to Lead. It started in January, like beginning of January. And essentially like, like they create like career simulation games that promote critical thinking and literacy skills amongst middle schoolers. And so like, I've actually like seen like for the first time, like a bridge of both like English and writing and like tech. And so like, cause I work both on like the creation of games and like the tech side, quality assurance, working with the software development team. And so like, I'm being able to like see a bridge of both my interests, but also like an impact and impacting like students and such through that program. So it's, yeah, that's the first time I've seen like a bridge of it and being able to actually use both of my interests at the same time for good. That was a really good question. And it kind of gave me permission to ask a burning question that I think if you're watching this, you're curious, potentially unrelated to poetry, the NASA internship. Can you <laughs> tell us just a little bit about that? Because if anyone heard that, their interest was peaked. So let's yeah. just call it like it is and share that. <laughs> yeah. So actually I've interned with NASA twice. So the first, the first time was the summer before 11th grade through this program called NASA Seas, which stands for NASA a STEM uh, Endorsement in Earth Science. And so I was essentially with a team of um, five other high schoolers working under a NASA subject matter expert. And essentially what we were working on was like possible like sustainable solutions to problems that COVID-19 brought on to the food supply chain within the United States. And so very much in like an ideating process and like looking at the NASA research, et cetera. And that was like eight months. And so at the end of it, we had a presentation, but I ended up like, it was, it was eight weeks and it was like really informative, but I ended up taking that and expanding upon it. So I did a research project and wrote like a 25 page research paper further, <laughs> further expanding on like uh, solutions to problems like first, like explaining what the problems that COVID-19 brought on to uh, the food supply chain are and uh, sustainable solutions and sort of like the next steps like the uh, the government should take in addressing these problems or that they could take. And then in terms of the second internship, the summer before my senior year, I was actually over at Johnson Space Center because I live in Houston. And so I was working, I was working with three college interns um, and we were working on radio frequency communication for the ISS. So we helped create a PCB. We worked on code for a, um, electronic wireless commu uh, communication attenuator, um, and then the establishment of an S-band transmitter receiver uh, and working on like the schematics for those. And so I, <laughs> yeah, those are like the two massive things that I've done. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm gonna just go on, but I've done like a lot of stuff. I love that. I love that. I wanna have a conversation just about that. Um, you know, I think as we, there's a lot more questions that we can ask um, and I wanna hold space if there's anyone else that has any other comments um, at this time, please do. Um, and Dennis ask if you could put up that slide for contact 
for Hannah. Um, I mean, if you weren't intrigued by the very beginning of this presentation, <laughs> I'm sure you are now. So, um, you know, feel free to reach out to Hannah or Dennis um, for more on connecting with Keiichi. Um, and y'all, if you like this discussion, which I hope you did, um, you know, check out more of our hashtag TX book chat series. Um, and you can just come to our, go to our website, uh, tsl.texas.gov slash center for the book. And you'll, you'll find that or just Google center for the book, book chat, you'll find it as well. Um, just the warmest and sincerest um, thank you for everyone that's, that's, that's been on this conversation. Um, KG, is there anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? Um, thank you for watching and please feel free to reach out. That's, that's what I hope. Perfect. All right. Well, I, I really thank everyone for watching as well. And this has just been a real gift mm -hmm. <laughs> to be a part of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.